thanks to all who have joined us by WebEx for standing by. Welcome to the open meeting of the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board. During the meeting, you'll be in listen-only mode. As a reminder, this meeting is being recorded and a recording is expected to be made available on the PCOB website. I would now like to turn to Chair Williams to formally convene the meeting. Good morning and welcome everyone. This is an open meeting of the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board on December 20th, 2022. We welcome those of you who have joined us today by webcast or dialing into the teleconference. Before we proceed with the agenda, I will note for the record that all board members are participating in this meeting and we are able, able to hear one another. The only order of business before the board today is a staff recommendation that the board propose for public comment a new standard on the auditor's use of confirmation, along with other conforming amendments to PCAOB standards. To present the staff's recommendation, I will turn to our Chief Auditor, Barbara Vanich. Uh, good morning, Chair Williams and board members Desparte, Ho, Stein, and Thompson. The Office of the Chief Auditor is pleased to recommend that the board issue a proposal on the auditor's use of confirmation. In its most basic form, confirmation is a technique used by auditors to obtain or verify information about a company through direct inquiry with a knowledgeable source outside the company. Confirmation can be an important source of evidence uh, and is used as part of an auditor's audit of a company's financial statements and has long been a technique used by auditors. The new proposed standard is designed to strengthen and modernize the requirements for the confirmation process. The new proposed standard is referred to as AS 2310, the auditor's use of confirmation, and would replace existing AS 2310, the confirmation process, in its entirety. The proposal follows rulemaking activity by the board, including a concept released in 2009 and a proposed rule in 2010. In developing this proposal, we analyzed the public comments received during the prior rulemaking activity, and we've considered developments in practice over the years. Additionally, we've continued to monitor audit firms' practices in this area by reviewing their methodologies and by analyzing information gathered through inspection and enforcement activities. Today, we are recommending that the board seek public comment on a new proposed standard, as well as proposed amendments to related PCOB standards. I would like to acknowledge the many people within the PCOB who provided significant contributions to this project. Uh, first, I would like to express my sincere appreciation to the team from the Office of the Chief Auditor that led this project. Dima Andrianko, Lisa Busidu, David Hardison, and Danny Verbeck as well as our other OCA colleagues who provided support on the project. Additionally, I would like to thank our colleagues from other offices and divisions for their significant contributions. In particular, I would like to thank Michael Gerbit, Tian Lang, Tasneem Rehan, and John Cook in the Office of Economic and Risk Analysis, and Annie Yan, Keisha Patrick, and Connor Rasso in the Office of General Counsel. I would also like to recognize the support and input provided by staff from the Division of Registration and Inspection, the Division of Enforcement Investigations, and the Office of Communication and Engagement. Finally, I would like to thank the Security and Exchange Commission staff, including the staff in the SEC's Office of the Chief Accountant, for their support and timely assistance on this project. Lisa Busidu and Danny Verbeck will now provide an overview of the proposal, and then Tian Lang will provide some additional remarks followed by a recommendation. Lisa? Thank you, Barb. Good morning, Chair Williams and board members. I'm gonna cover two key aspects of the new proposed standard. First, the integration of the requirements for the auditor's use of confirmation with the requirements of the PCAOB's risk assessment standards. And second, the situations in which the auditor should use or consider using confirmation in the audit. The existing standard on the confirmation process predates the PCAOB standards on risk assessment, which were issued in 2010. The new proposed standard would address how the auditor's use of confirmation would work in concert with the risk assessment standards. 
Fundamental to the PCAOB's risk assessment standards is the concept that as risk increases, so does the amount of evidence that the auditor should obtain. Further, evidence obtained from a knowledgeable source outside the company generally is more reliable than evidence obtained only from internal company sources. When properly designed and executed, the confirmation process can be an effective way of obtaining relevant and reliable external audit evidence, including in situations where the auditor identifies an elevated risk of material misstatement due to error or fraud. We believe that the confirmation procedures would generally provide more persuasive audit evidence than other types of audit procedures for two accounts in particular, namely cash and accounts receivable. With respect to cash, existing AS2310 does not separately address responsibilities for confirming cash. Under the new proposed standard, when auditing a company's cash held by a third party, which would also include cash equivalents, uh, the auditor should perform confirmation procedures. I would like to emphasize that under the new proposed standard, an auditor need not necessarily confirm all accounts, all cash accounts in all cases. As with other confirmation procedures under the new standard, an auditor would select individual cash items to confirm following the relevant direction in PCOB standards, including identifying and assessing the risk of misstatement and developing an audit response. The new proposed standard would emphasize that in selecting the individual items of cash to confirm, the auditor should take into account the auditor's understanding of the company's cash management and treasury function and the substance of the company's arrangements and transactions with third parties. In addition, with, in, uh, with respect to accounts receivable, the existing standard on confirmation has a requirement for the auditor to confirm accounts receivable and the new proposed standard would carry forward this requirement. There are certain differences, however, in the new proposed standard in describing the circumstances under which the presumption to confirm accounts receivable could be overcome. Under the new proposed standard, an auditor could overcome the presumption to confirm accounts receivable when the auditor determines that an audit response that only includes substantive audit procedures other than confirmation would provide audit evidence that's at least as persuasive as the evidence the auditor might expect to obtain through performing confirmation procedures. The auditor's determination would necessarily involve careful judgment when considering the assessed risk of material misstatement and the relative amount and quality of audit evidence that could be obtained from effective confirmation procedures in comparison with the audit evidence that could be obtained from audit procedures that do not include confirmation. The new proposed standard would also include a requirement for the auditor to communicate to the audit committee instances where the auditor has determined that the presumption to confirm accounts receivable has been overcome, including the auditor's basis for that determination. We believe that such a new communication requirement would enhance the audit committee's understanding of the auditor's strategy for auditing accounts receivable. The new proposed standard would also provide that the auditor should consider sending confirmation requests in certain additional situations, such as when the company has other financial relationships with confirming parties or has entered into complex or significant unusual transactions. Now I'd like to hand over to Danny, who will discuss some additional aspects of the new proposal. Thank you, Lisa. Good morning, Chair Williams and board members. This morning, I will discuss three additional aspects of the new proposed standard. The use of negative confirmation requests, the identification of situations in which alternative procedures should be performed by the auditor, and the use of internal auditors to provide direct assistance as part of the confirmation process. However, before I elaborate on these topics, I'd like to highlight that the new proposed standard is designed to accommodate changes in how communications occur between the auditor and confirming parties. These methods include not only traditional methods, such as the use of paper-based confirmation requests and responses sent via regular mail, but also increasingly common methods, such as the use of intermediaries to facilitate the direct electronic transmission of confirmation requests and responses. Having acknowledged this, let me now discuss the use of negative confirmation requests. With a negative confirmation request, 
the auditor requests a confirmation response only if the confirming party disagrees with the information provided in the request. The auditor generally obtains significantly less audit evidence when using negative confirmation requests than when using positive confirmation requests. Additionally, since the board's adoption of the existing standard, the likelihood that a negative confirmation request would not be considered by the recipient, either because the recipient would treat the request with suspicion, for example, as a phishing attempt, or not receive it at all, for example, if an emailed request were caught in a spam filter, has continued to increase. The new proposed standard states that auditors would not be able to use negative confirmation requests as the sole substantive procedure for addressing the risk of material misstatement to a financial statement assertion. Next, I'll discuss alternative procedures. Under the new proposed standard, alternative procedures are substantive audit procedures that an auditor performs when they are unable to obtain relevant and reliable audit evidence about one or more items selected for confirmation. Under the new proposed standard, the auditor should generally perform alternative procedures when the auditor is unable to identify a confirming party or when the auditor is unable to determine if a confirmation response is reliable. Additionally, the auditor should generally perform alternative procedures in the case of a non-response or an incomplete response. This range of situations would be broader than under existing AS 2310, which provides that, with certain exceptions, the auditor should apply alternative procedures where the auditor has not received replies to positive confirmation requests. Additionally, the new proposed standard provides examples of alternative procedures that may provide relevant and reliable audit evidence regarding accounts receivable, accounts payable, and the terms of a transaction or agreement. These provisions expand upon the examples of alternative procedures discussed in existing AS 2310. Finally, I will discuss the use of internal auditors to provide direct assistance as part of the confirmation process. The reliability of audit evidence provided by confirmation depends in large part on the auditor's ability to control the integrity of confirmation requests and responses. The new proposed standard would carry forward the provision in existing AS 2310 that the auditor should maintain control over the confirmation process to minimize the likelihood that information exchanged between the auditor and the confirming party is intercepted and altered. Under the new proposed standard, as part of maintaining control, the auditor should send confirmation requests directly to the confirming party and receive confirmation responses directly from the confirming party. Accordingly, the new proposed standard identifies certain activities in the confirmation process where the auditor may not use the assistance of the company's internal audit function. Specifically, the auditor would not be permitted to use internal auditors for selecting items to be confirmed, sending confirmation requests, and receiving confirmation responses. Lastly, the board is proposing amendments to several of its auditing standards to conform to the requirements of the new proposed auditing standard. That concludes my remarks. Thank you for your time and attention. I will now turn the floor over to Tian to provide some additional remarks followed by our recommendation. After that, we would be happy to respond to any questions you may have. Thank you, Danny. Good afternoon, Chair Williams and board members. As Barb noted earlier, confirmations are extensively used in audits. However, available evidence, including academic studies and results from inspections and enforcement activities, indicates that audit performance may be falling short in certain areas and that our current standard may not sufficiently address certain forms of electronic audit evidence. While some firms, particularly larger firms, have already begun to incorporate into their audit methodologies more robust procedures than our current standards require, others generally follow our current standard. The proposed enhancements to our standards that my OCA colleagues just finished outlining would lift the level of the firm's performance by promoting a focus on obtaining reliable audit evidence from the confirmation process. Strengthened and modernized requirements would address information asymmetry and moral hazards that might otherwise lead to an ineffective or improper use of confirmation. The proposed standard would also more clearly apply to developments in practice, including electronic communications, and address the use of third-party intermediaries in the confirmation process. 
Generally, we anticipate that the benefits and costs of the proposed standard would be modest, particularly given the updates to the internal methodologies that some firms have already under undertaken, in some cases, in response to initiatives by other standard setting bodies. We believe that investors would benefit from these enhancements in that an audit confirmation process designed and executed under the proposed standard would reduce the likelihood that the financial statements are materially misstated, whether due to error or fraud. Auditors may also benefit from enhanced clarity, which would reduce regulatory uncertainty and associated compliance costs. Firms would incur fixed costs to implement the proposed standard, including updating methodologies and training personnel, as well as variable engagement level costs to perform confirmation procedures in line with the enhanced standards. In closing, I would like to thank our colleagues in the Office of the Chief Auditor and the Office of the General Counsel at the PCOB and our friends at the SEC for their collaboration in the development of our economic analysis. With that, I'd like to hand it back to Barb to present the staff's recommendation. Thank you, everyone. In closing, the staff is recommending that the board issue for public comment a proposal related to the auditor's use of confirmation and related amendments to board standards substantially in the form provided to you. Thank you. Thank you, Barb, Lisa, Danny, and Tian. At this time, my fellow board members and I will have an opportunity to make a statement or ask questions to the staff. We will proceed in the order of seniority and I will begin. As the name suggests, confirmation is about verifying information on financial statements is accurate. It is the process auditors use to confirm certain information through independently obtained third party verification. Audit procedures that involve the use of confirmation are part of nearly every audit, and an effective confirmation standard is critical to maintaining audit quality and keeping investors protected. During times of economic uncertainty, confirmation can be a vital tool to help auditors combat fraud, making an effective confirmation standard more important today than ever. Unfortunately, like too many PCAOB standards, the confirmation standard hasn't changed since the board first adopted the existing standard AS2310, the confirmation process in 2003. For example, AS2310 still references fax machines when confirmation requests and responses between the auditor and the confirming party today are often exchanged via email or through an intermediary that facilitates the direct electronic transmission. It is so critical to ensure our confirmation standard is fit for purpose in today's capital markets to ensure investors receive the protection they deserve. And that is why I support strengthening and modernizing our requirements for auditors use of confirmation. I look forward to receiving input from all of our stakeholders. The confirmation project history is rather long from a standard setting perspective. The PCAOB initially issued a concept release in 2009 to solicit public comment on potential changes to the existing confirmation standard. That concept release was quickly followed by a proposed standard issued for public comment in 2010. Unfortunately, after 2010, the project stalled and no further rulemaking regarding the auditor's use of confirmation was issued by the PCAOB until today. The auditor's use of confirmation has been a required audit procedure in the United States that dates back to 1939, when the American Institute of Accountants adopted statement on auditing procedure number one as a direct response to the McKesson and Robbins fraud case, which involved fraudulent reporting inventories and accounts receivable that independent auditors failed to detect through procedures other than confirmation. Since then, independently obtained third party information continues to be an important source of evidence obtained as part of an audit of a company's financial statements. The world has evolved since AS2310 was adopted by the board, and today we are taking an important step toward making sure our confirmation standard keeps up and keeps investors protected. I would like to thank the individuals that are responsible for bringing this proposal to us. Specifically, I would like to thank in the Office of Chief Auditor, Barb Vantage, Dima Adrienko, Lisa Busidu, 
David Hardison, and Danny Verbeck. In the Office of Economic and Risk Analysis, Michael Gerbet, Tian Ling, Tasneem Rahan, and John Cook. And in the Office of General Counsel, Annie Yan, Keisha Patrick, and Connor Rasso. In addition, I would like to express my gratitude to my fellow board members and their staff for their contributions to this proposal. I would also like to recognize the support provided by the staff from the Division of Registration and Inspections, the Division of Enforcement and Investigations, and the Office of Communications and Engagement. Finally, I would like to thank the Securities and Exchange Commission's staff, including the staff in the SEC's Office of the Chief Accountant for their support and assistance. I will now turn to my fellow board members for any statements they may wish to make or questions they would like to pose to the staff. Board member Desparti, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair Williams, and good morning, everyone. Um, I support today's proposal. <clears throat> As you've heard, evidence obtained by the auditor from a knowledgeable third party source outside the company you know, generally is more reliable than evidence the auditor will obtain from internal company sources. And as such, confirmations have long been used on nearly every audit. A well-designed and well-executed confirmation process can be an effective way and an efficient way to validate various financial statement asser assertions, such as completeness, existence, or obligations, to name a few. Confirmations can also be useful in validating terms of significant transactions, identifying related parties, and addressing risks of misstatement from fraud. Today's proposal, as you've heard, serves to modernize our interim confirmation standard that was adopted by the board in 2003 uh, to account for the significant changes in the business environment since then, including the electronic transmission of confirmation requests and responses and the use of technology and third-party intermediaries to facilitate the confirmation process. The proposal also strengthens and clarifies our existing requirements, maintaining a principles-based approach within the context of our risk assessment standards. As you've heard, if adopted, the pro proposal will require auditors to confirm selected cash and cash equivalent amounts held by third parties. And the auditor should also consider confirming other financial relationships, such as lines of credit, guarantees, or off-balance sheet arrangements. These procedures likely will improve the reliability of audit evidence obtained and increase the likelihood of detecting potential fraud. The proposal also clarifies the auditor's responsibilities to evaluate confirmation responses and confirmation exceptions and to perform alternative procedures on incomplete or non-responses. Taken collectively, the changes proposed today are intended to better ensure the auditor obtains sufficient and appropriate audit evidence in support of the auditor's report. Please let us know what you think by responding to our questions in the proposal. Your feedback is invaluable in helping us craft the best possible final standard. I would also like to recognize and thank all the staff from across the PCAOB's divisions and offices who have contributed to today's proposal, especially, uh, and I, uh, I'll go through the list again because uh, people have worked really hard on this, especially Barb, Dima, Lisa, David, and Danny from the Office of the Chief Auditor, Mike, Kian, Tasneem, and John in the Office of the Economic and Risk Analysis, and Annie, Keisha, and Connor in the Office of General Counsel. I also thank my fellow board members and their staff, Brent Simer, Katie Driscoll, and Lucia Caramba from my team, and the staff from the SEC's Office of the Chief Accountant for all of their collaboration and sharing of perspectives on this important project. I turn it back to you, Chair Williams. Thank you. Board member Ho, the floor is yours. Chair Williams, good morning, everyone. Today, I cast my vote to support the proposed auditing standard on the auditor's use of confirmation and other proposals to the PCAOB standards. This new proposal applies to all audits conducted under PCAOB standards, is intended to be principles based, and expands confirmation methods to include electronic confirmations. 
Confirmations are critical audit procedures to obtain audit evidence from third parties concerning the existence of cash and other significant accounts, as well as to detect fraud. I am pleased that this proposal addresses some of the technological advancements in auditing. As noted in our strategic plan, PCAOB must continue to anticipate and respond to emerging trends impacting audit quality. To that end, this board recently launched the Technology Innovation Alliance Working Group, on which I'm privileged to serve as the chair. One overarching goal of this working group is to consider a holistic approach to emerging technologies and the associated impact to the PCAOB. I recently thought of an analogy related to moving into a 20-year-old house. While you could buy new furniture, have the house painted, and even get new flooring and new kitchen cabinets, you might also want to rethink the layout of the house and perhaps even make it smart, which might require rewiring the whole house. Rethinking the layout and making the house smart would take some time and has a more pervasive impact but we still want our house to be functional and comfortable. So we must take a multi-pronged approach in a logical sequence. I equate the work on our short-term and medium-term agenda, including this proposal to be synonymous to refreshing the old house. The TIA working group will develop recommendations for the board on strategic changes needed for the future. Thank you to those who work tirelessly on this proposal, including Barb Vantage, Dima Andrianko, Lisa Busidu, David Hardison, Danny Verbeck, Michael Gerbet, Tian Lian, Tasneem Rahan, and many others who have contributed to this proposal. As always, I look forward to commenters' feedback in helping the PCAOB refine this proposed standard with the ultimate interest of protecting investors. Thank you. Back to you, Chair Williams. Thank you. Board Member Stein, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Chair Williams. Today, we are considering how to modernize baseline auditor responsibilities for obtaining independent third-party evidence in an audit. Confirmation, also known as circulization, is as old as the practice of auditing itself. Um, in 1913, early auditing literature placed a heavy emphasis on the importance of obtaining independent third-party evidence when performing audits. Uh, the book instructed auditors that cash, quote, should be verified by independent confirmation, end quote, and that the confirmation of accounts receivable was quote, the only satisfactory verification, end quote. Um, as was mentioned by Chair Williams, in 1939, obtaining independent third-party evidence by confirmation became a generally accepted auditing procedure. In fact, it was the very first one. Um, this adoption was mainly as a result of the newly formed Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, the Commission's first financial fraud investigation found that a 17-year-long fraud at McKesson and Robbins would have been revealed years earlier if the auditor had simply confirmed what the company had reported for inventories and accounts receivable. So, as a result of this new generally accepted auditing procedure to gather independent third-party evidence, that became required for all audits. And if an auditor did not look for external evidence from confirmations, this had to be uh, highlighted for investors in the audit report. And yet, when a company suddenly implodes, many of us are often stunned to learn that basic audit procedures including obtaining independent third-party evidence through confirmation, were not used. Um, the Wirecard case in Germany is a good example. 
we are learning from the ongoing criminal trial that the alleged fraud, uh, the country's largest ever, involved vast amounts of fake revenues, a complex web of transactions routed through a variety of shell companies, and a false picture of financial strength and liquidity. The fraud unraveled when the company defaulted on bond payments, even though it looked like it had more than adequate cash on its balance sheet. Where was this online payment processor's $2 billion in cash located? And at the time, that was 25% of its balance sheet. Company management said the cash was in two banks in the Philippines. And this was supported by the company's records and the company's internal documents. But no one asked the banks. Let me just say that again. No one, including the company's independent auditor for many years, asked the banks. A few days before the company's bankruptcy, investigators sought out the banks. And both banks confirmed that there, were, there was no banking relationship with Wirecard and that there was no money. There never had been. Unfortunately, recent history is replete with examples of staggering corporate failures where a company's books, records, and internal documents provided a vastly different picture from economic reality. In 1999, discovery of Health South's $2.8 billion fraud and $300 million shell game and did 17 years of picture-perfect financial results. In 2002, family loans and an embezzled $1 billion was discovered at uh, uh, Delphia. And in 2003, nobody could find Parmalat's $5 billion in milk money. And in 2008, sham customer sales of Satyam were cut off as it was revealed that $1 billion in cash never existed. And as a former Senate staffer, I remember watching as the facade of Lehman's repo transactions crumbled, revealing its significantly off-market terms with its counterparties. Lehman's bankruptcy sparked what almost became a collapse of the financial system. So this list is nowhere near all-inclusive, but all of these cases involve a lack of challenge by the auditor or as the commission articulated in 1939, a failure to, quote, employ a degree of vigilance, inquisitiveness, and analysis of the evidence, end quote. And that is what confirmation is all about. So in my mind, today's proposed auditing standard is really about the auditor's challenge of management's assertions as part of the audit. Um, today's proposal emphasizes the auditor's duty to obtain the highest quality of audit evidence in response to that challenge. And certain valuable audit evidence can only be provided by a knowledgeable, independent third party. An auditor's use of confirmation can shed light on management's assertions, help identify related party transactions or complex arrangements, and verify the existence of cash. Properly designed confirmation procedures may involve the auditor using the confirmation process for balances, transactions, elements of an arrangement, management representations, or any information that supports assertions, assumptions, or estimates. Sometimes auditors have viewed requesting and obtaining confirmations as inefficient or troublesome. In 1974, the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants actually eliminated the requirement for auditors to tell investors when confirmation of accounts receivable was not performed by the auditor. It appears that the use of confirmations by public company auditors then declined after this mandatory requirement was removed. As mentioned previously, in response to a board proposal in 2010 to expand an auditor's use of confirmation, 
Audit firms largely opposed the proposal, while market participants asked for enhanced use of confirmation and that the board require confirmation of cash. We also, as uh, uh, both the staff and board member Ho mentioned, there have been a lot of advancements in technology uh, regarding confirmations, and that's also changing the audit landscape. The proposal before us today recognizes that electronic platforms have been developed by intermediaries that are making it easier and more efficient to obtain third-party confirmations. On the other hand, uh, some auditors have said that computer algorithms that they've developed themselves often can show a high degree of correlation among entries in a company's books and records such as postings for sale, accounts receivable, and cash. <clears throat> and that will provide similarly persuasive audit evidence to external confirmations, but at reduced effort and less cost. Um, these algorithms tend to validate the posting process, looking only at internal company information, which equates to a circular reference by using company data to validate company data. Instead of this mutually exclusive paradigm, an auditor's use of confirmations should be considered as a tool for a balanced information search strategy, beginning in the risk assessment and planning phases and proceeding throughout the audit. The resulting third-party evidence can identify or reveal side arrangements, management override of controls, round trip transactions, contingent losses, and again, unusual or complex arrangements. When combined with other information obtained during the audit, confirmations can raise the level of sufficiency and the reliability of the accumulated audit evidence. Of course, I am interested in all the comments regarding today's proposal. However, I am particularly interested in answers to the following three questions. First, would investors find it useful in making investment decisions to have more information about the auditor's use of confirmation? Would investors find it useful to have auditors describe how confirmation was or was not used during the audit? Second, does the proposed standard provide the auditor with sufficient flexibility to use the confirmation process to obtain independent third-party evidence in response to the audit risk assessment and for any element of a financial statement assertion or account. Uh, finally, uh, does the proposed standard provide, um, well, the proposed standard provides an auditor may conclude other procedures would result in audit evidence at least as persuasive as could be obtained from the confirmation process. How should that evidence be evaluated or that um, you know, statement by the firm? What factors should be used to make this determination and how can this be back tested? So uh, finally, I would like to thank all of the staff that have worked tirelessly uh, on this statement. Um, from the Office of the Chief Auditor, um, Lisa Busidu, Danny Verbeck, D David Hardison, and uh, uh, Dima Andriyanko. From our Office of Economic and Risk Analysis, uh, Tian Liang, Tasneem Rayan. And from our Office of General Counsel, Annie um, Yan, Keisha Patrick, and Connor Rasso. So I want to thank everyone, and I look forward to receiving feedback on today's proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Board Member Thompson, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair Williams. As mentioned, today we are issuing a proposal that would update the legacy standard concerning the auditor's use of confirmation procedures. Much of the audit evidence made available to the auditor during the course of an audit is provided by the issuer's management. The distinguishing characteristic of confirmation procedures is that they involve the auditor gathering audit evidence directly from third parties outside of the audit client, thus reducing the risk of manipulation of audit evidence and increasing the reliability of that audit evidence. 
Confirmations, in particular, of cash and accounts receivable are widely accepted and executed audit procedures by the profession. Fictitious bank accounts and receivables have been a prominent feature of many frauds which spurred the need for standards as early as the 1930s. Given the increased risk of fraud in this current economic environment, I am particularly interested to see comment or reviews on whether the proposal strikes the right balance with respect to the auditor's consideration of confirmation procedures in response to significant risk arising from other kinds of transactions or arrangements with third party. This proposal also requires communication to the audit committee in instances where the auditor has determined that the presumption to confirm accounts receivable has been overcome. Having audit committees aware of when their auditor determines to overcome that presumption strengthens their ability to perform their oversight role of the audit committee over auditor judgment. The confirmation process has evolved significantly with the use of electronic means of confirmation and diligence is essential to ensure reliability of electronic confirmation responses and to combat undue reliance on technology. This proposal highlights that the quality of the audit evidence obtained through confirmation procedures, regardless of means provided, is integral to the audit process. I want to thank the staff for their work on this rulemaking. Uh, in particular, I'd like to thank Barb Banich, Dima Andreenko, Lisa Husadu, David Hardison, and David uh, Dana. Pardon me, Danny Verback in the office of the Chief Auditor, Mike Gerbit, Tian Lang, Tassim Rahan, and John Cook of the Audit uh, Office of Economic and Risk Analysis, Anna Yane, Keisha Patrick, and Connor Rasu in the Office of the General Counsel. The input provided by the Division of Registration and Inspections and the Division of Enforcement based on inspection and investigations experience in my fellow board members and the board staff. Thank you. Thank you. Unless there are any further discussions from the board, I would now call for a vote on the staff's recommendation. Board member Desparti? Aye. Thank you. Board member Ho? Board member Ho? I'll circle back to board member Ho. Board member Stein? Aye. Board member Thompson? Aye. Board member Ho? Aye. Thank you, I heard you. All votes are unanimous. The recommendation is approved. That concludes the PCOB's open meeting for today. As there is no further business, this meeting is now adjourned. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect from the webcast and teleconference.